let's start. Today we are going to talk about reinforcement learning. So, so far we have talked about supervised learning, unsupervised learning, self-supervised learning, and some related problems. The main goal in reinforcement learning is to understand sequential decision-making uh, problems, right? So that's going to be our main objective to deal with sequential decision-making problems. And what I mean by that, it means when your current decisions influence your future decisions. Remember, that wasn't the case, for example, in the classification problem. In the classification problem, whatever you classify for an image, it doesn't influence your classification for the next images. But in many cases, your current decision, your current actions can influence your future decisions and actions. So in other words, your current decisions can affect future decisions or actions. So what are the examples uh, of uh, such decision, sequential decision-making uh, problems? Obviously in um, yes, exactly. Chess uh, is one example, right? Or other games uh, that are interactive. So you uh, make a move on a board and then the, the state of that game changes. And based on that, you need to make another decision. So your, your future decisions depend on your current decisions. So what, what are other examples? Um, Oh, that's, that's a good answer. Life, yes, so you make a decision. Uh, for example, you, you, you all made a decision to take this course uh, and that decision will uh, affect, hopefully positively, your future decisions. And so that's, that's an important um, uh, aspect. Uh, what are other um, machine learning examples for such problems? Path planning, yes. Robotics, definitely. Um, you know, robots, when they um, go explore or try to do a task, their um, present decisions will um, you know, have the same property that will influence their future decisions. Games, yes, all of them are uh, examples. So let me write some of them up. Games, robotics, you know, self-driving cars, right? Which is a, which is an important cars, finance, etc. So as you can see, it's a very important uh, chunk of problems that we uh, need to have a better understanding about. Okay, so in all of these uh, problems, or most of these problems, Let's say we have an agent or user, and this agent uh, decides to take a particular action at a particular time. And so let's say this is the action that the agent takes. If you are playing a game, you decide to um, you know move uh, you know one of your you know checkers or something on the board. Uh, in a particular fashion, so that's your action. And that action can change the um, state of the game. So you uh, basically, we, based on this action that you are taking, uh, we, we have an environment. I'm just being very broad here. And it will take us to a new state in the environment. So you have a new state of the environment 
based on the actions that you have uh, taken. So we started in, let's say, state ST, and we end up in state ST plus one. Okay, so that's basically the dynamics that we have. And then again, this is a loop, right? So now you are a new state, uh, you take a new action, and then based on the environment that you have, you will uh, be taken into a new state, and this process uh, repeats. Is there no perception? That's a good uh, question. So hold on to that question. So um, uh, I'll uh, make it a little bit more precise what we mean by all of these um, states and actions in a second. So let's start with some uh, definitions. Okay, so let's say S is the uh, is my state space. What I mean by that, it is the sufficient description of the system. So if you, um, you know, are for example um, designing a self-driving car, uh, the velocity, the, the the lane you are at, the 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 cars next to you, the positions of the cars nearby. All of them, they define a particular state, right? So if you look at all possible um, descriptions, sufficient descriptions of um, the underlying um, system, that will uh, be a particular state. And the set of all states will denote by capital S, which is the state space. So in some cases, we uh, don't directly um, observe this state, right? So we have some uh, observations. So maybe if you are um, designing, and again, back to the self-driving car example, maybe another car is blocking your, um, your view. So the state of the problem may be different than what you're observing. So you may not have a full observation, you may have a partial observation. Um, and that's an important aspect of this problem, but um, at least during today's lecture, we are not going to uh, talk about partial observation. So we are going to um, consider the case that the agent can observe the entire state. So we have a full observation of the state when we are at a particular state. Okay, um, state, states can be represented either as discrete or continuous variables. So for example, if you are playing chess, then based on the positions of um, the board, you have a discrete space, a discrete space. But if you are, uh, for example, representing velocity or some other continuous variables, your states will be uh, represented by you know, continuous variables. And in general, you can have a mixture between uh, both discrete and continuous variables. Then we are going to consider a set of actions represented by A, set of actions. And again, uh, similar to the states, actions can be either discrete variables or they can be continuous variables. You can say, for example, turn left or right. Now, this is a discrete variable. It's a binary variable, in fact. Uh, but you can also have continuous actions. For example, you can say um, to have the following speed, and speed is a continuous, um, continuous variable. Right, so that's state action. We also need another um, notation, another concept to um, basically we have states here, we have actions here. We need another thing to represent the environment, right? So it's a very broad term, what I mean by the environment. So for that, we are going to have a probabilistic representation and characterization of the environment using a matrix, a transition uh, probability matrix represented by uh, P. So P is uh, the transition 
probabilities or dynamics, some people may say. So it basically models the environment for us. Roughly speaking, it says if you are at a particular state, if you have taken particular actions, if you end up in a particular state, then what will be your um, next state uh, given all your uh, past actions? Right? So that's basically the, 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 the transition probability that we have here to take you to um, another state. So remember, so we don't have a full control of the environment. So if you're taking a particular action, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to deterministically be in another state. Otherwise, we would have been like, you know, very happy in life because we would take actions to be in a particular state. So there is usually some randomness in the uh, environment and even though you are taking a particular action, that randomness may take you to another state that you did not desire. So that's the randomness that is being represented by these transition uh, probabilities. Okay, um, uh, let's look at uh, one example, very simple example, just to warm up. Let's say I'm looking at a problem uh, with only two states, and I also have only two actions. So I start with a particular, at time zero, I start, let's say, in state one, right? And then I'll have two choices for my actions. Either I'll uh, take let's say action one, or I'll take action two. If I take action one, I may end up in state one, the same state I started with, with certain probability. Right? So that's the transition probability that I'm, I was uh, telling you about. So there will be a probability that I'm going to be in state one at time one, given my past, given that I started at the state one and I took action one. But there is also a chance that I'll end up in another state after taking this particular action. And the probability of that would be represented by probability of S1 is equal to two given my past. And the same thing can be state, stated for the case if I take second action. Right? So you have these probabilities. So basically we have states, we have actions, we have transition probabilities. Okay, so uh, sometimes uh, this is called backup diagram. Just the terminology sometimes people use. Okay, so in general, my state at time t depends on the entire past states and states that I have visited and the actions I have uh, taken. So it will be a distribution of let's say a particular state that I end up given all, let's say I started with state zero, took action A zero, then state one, end up in state one, took action A one, up until a time T minus one. So oftentimes we refer to as the trajectory represented by tau. 
tau t minus one represents all the states I have visited and all the actions I have previously uh, taken. Okay, so that's basically the model that uh, we have. Um, okay, so I see a few questions. Let me um, see. Um, okay, so thanks for other students who answer each other's questions. That's good. Um, okay, so what would be an issue if we think about this general case? Right, so my current state depends on the entire past states and actions I have uh, taken. Okay, yeah, that's a good um, uh, answer. The answer is problem size is huge. Right, so if you think about it, let's say even in the simplest case, when we have only two states and two actions, right, so if you look at um, t time steps, then you'll get um, two t variables, let's say binary variables in the, the minimal case, and then the number of possibilities will be like two to the power two t, which will grow exponentially with time. And uh, that can be a very, very uh, difficult um, problem. Um, very complex for large t. So that's, that's going to be an issue. So in many um, cases, maybe we can relax this. We can say, for example, uh, the state that I'm going to end up at time t only depends on five previously, uh, five previously taken actions and states that I have visited. Or in an extreme case, we can assume that my state at time t only depends on my immediate previous past action and the state that I have visited. So that's often called the Markov assumptions. Let me say the state that I end up at time t only depends on my immediate previous past um, state and action. And that greatly simplifies the problem because now we don't have an exponentially growing problem size. But before I move forward, let's you know, consider some games or some other examples that we have um, discussed at the beginning of today's lecture. Is this a good assumption? So Sai says no, why not? I see some yeses and some noes. In chess, you know, perhaps yes, uh, because the state of the board, wherever you end up, then you, you, you know, make a move based on that or based on like, you know, um, a few uh, past um, moves. Uh, but let's consider poker, for example, right? So you, you are, you know, even in, from the first, actions you are learning something about your opponent you are saying that okay so this opponent is you know oftentimes bluffing or playing uh, conservative so these are important factors that you are learning from your uh, first um, earlier uh, states and actions and that can be that can be important in your um, even very very far uh, uh, in the future states and actions so in some cases it's a reasonable assumption. In some cases, it is less reasonable, but um, because the alternative is very complex in terms of the problem size, so we are going to uh, mainly focus on the case that we have the mark of assumption. Okay.
All right, so now we basically uh, set up the problem, but the question is, what is the objective here? Remember, in the classification uh, problem, we had a very well-defined objective in order to predict the labels. Right. So here, of course, in a game, we want to win the game. But how we can characterize that um, objective function? So we often do that using uh, reward functions. So if we go back to the picture that we started with, we are saying that, OK, so if, you if you're taking a particular action, you are going to collect some reward. Let's call this reward at time t. And this reward can be negative if you are uh, making a bad move. So ultimately, the goal is to maximize the total uh, collected reward during the game. Right, so that's going to be our uh, main objective, to maximize the total collected rewards. And as before, again, your reward function can depend uh, potentially on your uh, previous states and actions, but one assumption that we are going to have, again, the reward function is going to be only a function of your current state and the action that you are taking. So this is going to be referred to as the reward function. Okay, so there's a question. Do people uh, assume time homogeneity of the Markov chain? So I'll talk about that. So hold on on that thought. Okay, so if I wanna draw a trajectory and summarize what we have uh, talked already. So we start with a particular state, a zero, we take a particular action, a zero, then goes to the environment uh, using the transition um, probabilities will end up in another state, let's say S1, I'll take another action, A1, and the, and, uh, the, 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 the dynamic continues. So in each uh, state, uh, state action pairs, I'll collect a particular reward, R1, R2, R3, so on and so forth. So my goal is to maximize the total uh, rewards that I'm uh, collecting, Let's say this is my R total will be R0 plus R1 plus R2 plus so on and so forth. So that's the total uh, rewards that I'm collecting. So two points here. In practice, who gives us the reward function? First of all, I'm assuming this reward function is a uh, given. Right, so, um, so in fact, if you are like, for example, designing a robot, or if you are thinking about a self-driving car uh, design, what is the reward function? So, uh, okay, so let me see some responses. Uh, okay, so. Um, distance to the goal, uh, that's, a, that's a good response. If you are playing a particular game, in some games you are in fact collecting, you see the scores that you have, and that can be your uh, reward, what scores you are obtaining or losing. Uh, but there is in fact a, an area in reinforcement learning to um, 
infer a good reward function, right? So that's, uh, that's a key element of the reinforcement uh, learning problem. If you, for example, have some experts to perform a particular task, and then maybe based on that, you can learn a good reward function to uh, be used in, um, in, in the problem. So uh, that's an important uh, topic. If you have time, I'll talk a little bit about that in the next lectures. But at this point, let's assume that the reward function is given. Okay, now, we also have uh, two regimes. One is the case that we have a finite horizon. So you have these um, actions uh, by time t, and t is finite. But there may be like some uh, cyclic games that you uh, have uh, infinite horizon. The game never stops. And in that case, the capital T goes to infinity. T is the number of uh, steps that we are um, taking in our decision making. So in the latter case, let's uh, think about the latter case and think about this total reward. If these rewards are, let's say, some positive numbers and you're uh, adding potentially infinitely many positive numbers, then the total reward can go to infinity. Right, so in this case, then comparing two scenarios, two set of actions, uh, will be impossible because in both cases, it is very likely that my uh, total rewards will be infinity. So to deal with that case, we also introduce another concept called discount factor. Which says today's reward is slightly worth more than tomorrow's rewards. A bit more than tomorrow's reward. And in many cases, in, even in you know real life, that's um, that's true, right? So if you, you know, are um, let's say given, you know, a million dollar today, with respect to a million dollar, let's say in twenty years, they may not um, be equivalent, right? So you will probably like to have the money um, sooner rather rather than later. So in that case, our total reward would be the following. We have R0 plus gamma times R1 plus gamma square R2. And gamma is our discount factor. Which is a number between 0 and 1. OK. so. That's basically all the uh, terminologies that we uh, need to start talking about how to uh, formulate this problem, what are uh, the solutions that we can think about. Let me pause here and see if there are any questions. Are there methods that don't assume the Markov uh, assumption? Uh, there are some um, some methods that you know even like without the um, uh, immediate Markov assumption, you can create larger Markovs by combining states, and then you can use the current methods. But most of the current methods they are based on the Markov assumptions. 
So in the next lecture, I'll talk about some more general methods, uh, but today we are going to mainly uh, focus on, um, on the case when we have the Markov assumption. Even like in a deep RL, Markov assumption is a key element in many of these um, uh, methods. Okay, so let me uh, move on. So now we are at the point that we can talk about some of the RL formulations. We'll start with classical RL formulations. And in the next uh, lectures, we'll talk about modern which in many cases are deep RL formulations. So today we are going to mainly focus on classical RL, which uh, is very important in order to have a good foundations to think about modern RL approaches. In particular, we are going to start with finite Markov decision processes or MDPs. Okay, so here is the problem setup. S, which is the state space, will be finite. We have finite number of states. We also assume to have finite number of actions. Again, the transition probabilities will be according to a Markov uh, assumption. The probability that we are at a particular state at time t will only depend on the immediate previous past state and action. The reward function will be a function of my current state and action and we'll have gamma which is the discount factor. All right, so these are the assumptions that we have. And using these notations, we can fully define a Markov decision process problem. All right, what is the goal? The goal is to choose actions to maximize the total reward. The function that will tell us which action to take at the particular state is called the policy function. So we have a policy function which determines how actions should be taken. And so you have a policy function pi applied to actions and applied to states and will give me uh, actions. But that's the uh, policy function. The policy function can output a single action for me to take or it can output a distribution of actions and then I can probabilistically uh, choose a particular action to take. The policy function 
would yield a distribution on actions often referred to as stochastic policies or uh, it can be deterministic. So in today's lecture, we are going to consider only deterministic policy functions. Meaning that if I if I'm in a particular state S and I take uh, my, my policy would tell me to take a particular action A. So it's going to, my action is going to be a deterministic function of my uh, policy, of my state. So in fact, uh, I'll talk about it later on, but this suffices for MDPs. In MDP, um, I haven't talked about optimal policies, but there is always a deterministic optimal policy. So we are not losing anything by restricting ourselves to deterministic policies. Also, we are going to assume the policies, the policy function is time invariant. If my policy function tells me to take action one in state one, it doesn't matter at what time I have visited that particular state. If I have visited in time zero, it's going to tell me to take the same action to the case that if I visited that state in time, say 100. So we have time invariant policies in today's lecture. Okay, so with this assumption, uh, I can simplify my transition probability uh, notation. Remember transition probability depends on the previous state and action, but no action depends on that state and the particular policy. So instead we are going to use this notation that my transition probability is represented by pi, p of pi, because of the policy gives me a particular action. I end up in state S prime if I'm at state S. I'm at state S and I take action according to pi and with some probability I end up in state S prime. So this is a, a little bit of a, an easier notation to use. Okay, so let me pause and see if there are any questions. Is optimality true also for time um, invariant deterministic policies? Yes, I haven't even talked about optimality, but the answer is yes. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. Why would you want to, uh, why would you want it to be stochastic? If you consider both stochastic and deterministic policies, it's a larger space. So potentially you uh, may end up in um, larger uh, rewards in general, but in MDPs, in fact, that's not going to be the case. Okay, so let me uh, move on. Right, so we need uh, two more uh, concepts before we talk about optimality of uh, any of these policies or how we can compute good policies. So one concept is called the value function. So the value function tells me if I start at a particular state and 
I follow a particular policy, what would be my expected reward? Let's say at time zero, you start in a particular state and then you just follow that policy that you have um, chosen. That policy will tell you to take a particular action and then the environment that you have no control about will take you to another state and you use the same policy to choose your next action then environment takes you to another state so on and so forth and during this process you collect some rewards r0 r1 r2 so on and so forth so the value function is the expected reward if we start at state s a particular state and follow policy pi so we represent that with v stands for value function v pi of s is the expected reward that we collect if my initial state is s and I follow policy pi. So that's called the value function. So the second concept is a function called action value function or q function. So here we start again at a particular state and we take a particular action. It doesn't have to be according to my policy. But after the first action, we have to follow the policy for the future actions. So I start at a particular state. I take particular action. It doesn't have to be can be different than pi of s0, can be a different, um, different action. The environment will take us to a, a particular state, but after this first step, I'm going to follow policy. My second action will be according to the policy. I'm going to end up in another state, and so on and so forth. So after this, I'm going to follow pi. So this function is referred to as q pi s and a, which will be the expected collected rewards as before, given my initial action is according to a, my initial state is s and then i follow policy pi it's referred to as a q function or action value function some definitions you will see why they become important in characterizing and solving mvps let me pause and see if there are any questions Is an R0 just zero? No, it doesn't have to. So R0 depends on your um, initial, let's say, state and action. So it doesn't have to be zero. Okay, so we have um, value function. We have uh, state uh, action value or Q function. Now we are ready to, um, to talk about some of the uh, some of the methods okay so the first uh, question that i need to answer is that if i give you a particular policy
Let's say I give you a policy pi. Can you evaluate the value function of this policy if I start in a particular state? So remember, what is the definition of the value function? So it is the sum of the rewards that we collect if I start at that state and then I follow policy pi. Right? So how can I compute this expectation? So first of all, what is this expectation over? Where is the randomness in this problem? The randomness comes from the transition probabilities, exactly. So you, your policy tells you exactly what action you, you need to take. So the only randomness that we have comes in these steps, right? So I don't know which state I'm going to end up after taking the particular action. So that's the expectation of. So one uh, way potentially um, um, to, uh, in order to compute and evaluate this policy as you know, one of you mentioned is based on like something similar to Monte Carlo sampling. Or in other words, generate different trajectories. Right? So you start with state S, that's your start. And then run your policy. Right? So you have different trajectories, let's say tau one. By trajectories, I mean the states and actions that you are taken. Again, it is random because the environment is random. So you are not going to end up in a deterministic uh, trajectory. So if you run it, maybe at the, at the next uh, run, we will have the same uh, first um, uh, few states and actions, and then they will diverge. Or maybe there you have something else. So tau two, tau three. So these are your trajectories. And then for each of them, you can compute your rewards. And then take the average. But as you can see, just to evaluate the policy we have uh, using this averaging or Monte Carlo sampling, we need to generate many trajectories in order to have a reliable estimation. And that can be quite sample inefficient. Okay, so what can we do about it? How can I evaluate a policy more efficiently? How can we estimate the value of the policy directly? That's the question. Okay, so let's, um, we can estimate the values of the next states inductively. Uh, I think you guys are, you know, thinking in the, in the correct uh, direction. So let's look at this value function a little bit closer and see what we, what we get, right? So this is my value function. It says, if I start at a particular state, what would be the average total rewards that I'm going to collect? So here I take a particular action according to my policy. That's the action that I take, that's A0. And the environment with certain probabilities is going to take me to different states. I may end up in state S1, I may S1, let's say one, I may end up in S1, two, in different states. Let's say I have, for example, these states. Now let's just think about starting the problem here. 
I start the problem at this particular state at time one, then I can subtract times, you know, by one. So that's my initial time. Let's ignore uh, the rest. So if I just run my policy, the average total rewards that I'm going to collect will be what? Will be according to the function v pi if I start at state one. Same here. So if I run my policy here, the total rewards that I'm going to get is going to be according to v pi because that's the function that I have defined, evaluated at state two. So therefore, I can write the value function at the state s. Okay, so I have some rewards that I collect at the beginning, r0 plus gamma, which is the discount factor, then with certain probability, I'm going to end up in a particular state, S prime, let's say S prime is one. And after that, I'm following policy pi, and the average collected reward would be V pi of S prime. So here we get a recursive equation relating v pi to itself because it's an infinite horizon game so by shifting by one time step it really doesn't change the total reward that you have sometimes this is referred to as bellman's recursion Okay, so that's a good um, recursive uh, equality to have. Are there any questions about this? If not, because, uh, okay, so uh, still not computable. Good, good uh, observation. But now I can try to use this recursive equation in order to have a more efficient way to compute the value function. Okay, so let's say, uh, let's have some, uh, some uh, definitions. This value function is evaluated at the state one, at the state two, at the state D. So I'm going to put all of the value functions in a vector. So I'm going to define it as a vector called v of pi, which will be value function of state one, value function if I start at state two, and value function if I start at state d. Let's say I have d states. Again, same as the initial rewards for the states. So I have r0, r1, to r d. And I'm going to define a transition uh, probability matrix P sub pi that has the transition probabilities going from S prime to S. So here is uh, S prime and this is S. This tells me what is the probability of uh, going from a particular state so in fact, let me use this as S and use this as S prime to, a, to another state S prime. So these are some notations. Remember this recursive equation that we have, we have how many of them? We have D of them. And so let me actually write them up just to make it very clear. So we have one first um, recursion that we have, R1 plus gamma times S prime if I start at state one, then I have D of them, right? So I can write this for all the initial states that we have. D 
the equations are uh, harder to um, track, so I'm going to write them in a matrix format. So in a matrix format, I can put all of these in a vector. So it will be a vector v pi. All of the rewards, initial rewards, I'll put in vector r as before. I have gamma. And if you think about this, this is like just a matrix uh, vector product. So we'll have matrix transition matrix pi of uh, p of pi times v pi. So all of these d recursive equations can be summarized in uh, in a more concise way uh, like this. Is this clear? Okay, good. Now you can see how we can compute vpi efficiently, right? So one way to do it is to bring this term to the right hand side. So we'll have identity minus gamma times p sub pi times vpi would be equal to r. And from here, I have a closed form solution. for my value function. So these are rewards, I have it. Transition uh, probabilities, I assume I have it. So I'm going to talk about you know, these, um, the cases, more practical cases when we don't have it in the next lectures. This con factor, that's uh, my uh, design choice. And that's the formula that I have. So if this matrix is invertible, then I can compute my value function using this closed form formula. But how can I know if this matrix is going to be invertible or not? Can we be in a situation that the matrix may not be invertible? So in fact, that's not going to be the case. Uh, because if you think about this matrix p sub pi, again, this matrix, it has probabilities, it's prime to s. This is s, this is s prime. So the sum of the rows elements will be one because, you know, from state s, you will with probability one will go to another state. So if you sum up all the probabilities, it will be one. So it is called a stochastic matrix when you have, and the elements are uh, non-zero uh, and non-negative. You have a stochastic matrix with these prop uh, properties. So first of all, this matrix is not symmetric. So that means if you look at eigenvalues of this matrix, the eigenvalues can uh, be complex numbers. But if you look at the magnitude of eigenvalues, the magnitude of eigenvalues will be always less or equal to one for all of the eigenvalues. In fact, there is an eigenvector that corresponds to an eigenvalue of one. So this equality holds. It's a tight, um, tight inequality. So if you take vector all one, it's an eigenvector. with corresponding eigenvalue of one. Very easy to check. 
Therefore, if you look at this matrix, identity minus gamma times p sub pi, because here the eigenvalues, the magnitudes are less or equal to one, gamma is a number less than one. Therefore, this matrix will always have um, uh, inverse. Uh, it will not have zero eigenvalues. So this is going to be always inverted. Then I can compute this inverse and evaluate my uh, policy um, using this formula that I have. But is this a good way to evaluate a policy? Okay, so at least we don't have non-invertibility issue, but is it, is, it a pra is it something that I can use in practice efficiently? Okay, good answer. It is computationally expensive because it involves a matrix inversion step. And this matrix, if you think about the size of the matrix is D by D based on the size of the state space that you have. And if D is large, this inverse can be computationally expensive. Okay, so what can we do about this? I wanna have a more efficient way to solve uh, this equation to compute the value function for a, for a particular policy. Okay, so we are going to have an iterative approach in order to deal with this problem. That's going to be more efficient. It's called value iteration. Or sometimes people refer to as Bellman recursion. So here's the equation that we have. V sub pi is equal to R plus gamma times P sub pi times V sub pi. Let's define an operator L sub pi. When I apply this operator on a vector, what it does, it computes R plus gamma times P sub pi multiplied with that vector. Therefore, this equation that I have here can be just written as V sub pi is equal to L sub pi applied to V sub pi. In other words, V sub pi is a fixed point to this operator. So it's a fixed point when I apply this operator, it doesn't change my uh, v sub pi. Okay, so in order to um, uh, be able to compute v sub pi, we'll use some properties from um, contractions, operators that are contractions. I'll explain what I mean by contractions. Contraction mean that if you take two vectors, v1 and v2, you apply your operator, the distance between two vectors shrinks. In that case, it is called a contraction. So the claim here is that this operator is in fact a contraction. If you take two vectors, v1 and v2, you apply this operator on those vectors, it will, um, it will re reduce their uh, distance. And based on that, we can um, have an iterative algorithm in order to, in order to compute the value uh, function. 
Okay, so let me look at the time. I think you're running out of time. So I'll uh, pause here and take questions and the next lecture, I'll um, first talk about the proof that it's a very simple proof, two line proof that this operator is a contraction. And then argue how we can use this property in order to efficiently compute the value function. And then we are going to use this in order to compute optimal policies. And hopefully by the end of, um, or from middle of uh, next lecture, we can relax some of these restrictive assumptions that we started with. For example, when the states are finite or we have transition probability. So in practice, these assumptions are unrealistic and we wanna see how we can relax these assumptions to use some of these techniques in uh, practice. Let me pause here and see if there are any questions.